Hi, you're joining us live from Ithaca, New York, home of Cornell University. I'm Dr. Steve Osofsky, wildlife veterinarian and director of the Cornell Wildlife Health Center. We're really glad you've joined us for this uh, hopefully fascinating hour of programming that we've put together for you. And this is the first of what I hope will be a series of webinars focused on One Health topics from around the world in an exciting new collaboration between the Cornell Wildlife Health Center, the College of Veterinary Medicine, and eCornell. I want to tell you a little bit about the center. We strive to sustain a healthier world by developing and implementing proactive science-based solutions to challenges at the interface of wildlife health, domestic animal health, human health and livelihoods, all recognizing that all of those things are underpinned by environmental stewardship. Our vision really is a healthy future for wildlife, people, and planet. Our mission is to transform science into impact through discovery, education, engagement, and policy to ensure a healthy future for wildlife and the environment that supports us all. And we like to explain why. We say that it's because we need nature and now nature needs us. And what I mean by that is we need nature for a lot of things we take for granted. Clean water, climate that's stabilized, carbon sequestration, pollinating services, clean air, and nature needs us. A lot of people think nature doesn't need us, nature will be fine. But today, nature needs us to be more mindful, more respectful, not to mine it, but to use it sustainably so that future generations can all benefit from all the services that the world's ecosystems provide. Everything we're going to talk about today, in one way or another, relates to the relationships between our own health, the health of our wildlife, the health of our domestic animals, and again, how the way we steward the environment relates to all of those interactions. I want to sort of explain the four pillars that we use to advance our work. First, around the world, we respond to the health threats facing key species and their survival. Many of our team members provide landscape level guidance on wildlife compatible land use policies and practices around the world. We all work to minimize disease transfer at the interface of wildlife, livestock, and people. And all of this really rolls up into building new constituencies for wildlife conservation. What I mean is in many parts of the world, conservation is sometimes a luxury. But if we can make our work more clearly relevant to the public health sector, to, the public health sector, to ministries of finance, to the agriculture sector, we're building new constituencies. And I hope by the end of this hour, you'll see how all of these things do interdigitate and support each other. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. And again, today's session is focused on North America. And I'm very pleased to have my colleague, Dr. Kristen Schuler, with us today. Kristen is a wildlife disease ecologist interested in the health of wildlife populations and associations with human and domestic animal activities and diseases. Her focus is on conserving free ranging species on into the future. This involves a multidisciplinary approach involving risk analysis, field studies, human dimensions, and lab work. Since 2011, Kristen has worked with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation on the cooperative New York State Wildlife Health Program. Prior to relocating to New York, she served as a field epidemiologist with the U.S. Geological Survey National Wildlife Health Center in Madison, Wisconsin, investigating wildlife mortality events and training biologists around the country in wildlife health. She has projects looking at moose health in the Adirondacks region, geographical epidemiology of bear mange, white-tailed deer fawn survival, population modeling of lead impacts on bald eagles, and chytrid fungus in eastern hellbender salamanders. And right now, you're going to hear a lot more about Dr. Schuler's work. Kristen. All right. Thank you, Steve. I'm uh, really pleased to be here as the director of the Cornell Wildlife Health Lab to tell you a little bit about what we do at the lab. And with this, I'm going to highlight the work that we do with New York State as a collaborative wildlife health program with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. So we founded this program in 2011, and the goal really is to promote the health and sustainability of wildlife populations. And we do that through the integration of veterinary medicine and wildlife ecology. And so this partnership with the state agency and the College of Veterinary Medicine was really unique. And when we stood this program up, we identified nine different program areas that were really important. And unfortunately, I don't have time to get into all of them today, but I wanted to highlight a, a few of the key elements that are related to this One Health concept, bringing together people, the environment, and animals. 
So one of the major activities that we participate in is health and disease surveillance. And so I've, I've listed some of the diseases that we're looking for, and ones that I'll talk about today um, include chronic wasting disease, SARS-CoV-2 that we're all very familiar with. Uh, Dr. Bloodgood will talk about highly pathogenic avian influenza, and then we'll cover some of the other uh, research projects and interests that we have. So with this program, uh, it's really important to use the public as our eyes and ears out in the wild. And so when somebody might come upon a, a sick or dead animal and they want to report it, typically they'll do that to their state wildlife agency. And depending on what the animal is and the conditions, we have criteria set up where that biologist would then go out and recover that animal and they can bring it in for a full diagnostic examination and that's called a necropsy. And at the Animal Health Diagnostic Center where our lab is located, we have the capacity to do a lot of different disease testing. So we're looking at birds, mammals, and then herpetofauna are turtles, uh, snakes, and uh, amphibians. And we're able to track trends over time. And doing this work, looking at necropsies, gives us a really good baseline for knowing what's normal and what's abnormal. So by looking at trends over time, usually we have uh, the largest increase in specimens submitted during the summer, but fall is often an important time when you have hunting seasons and people are out in the woods. And this lets us know if uh, we, there's an unusual uh, new disease that we should be on the lookout for that we'll talk about more with avian influenza. And we're able to categorize the animals that come in for examination as far as what they died from. And so those typically end up being something like bacterial, fungal, uh, parasitic. A lot of the cases we see are, are related to trauma, and that might be something that is human-induced. So uh, not necessarily just uh, vehicle accidents, but if there are other um, injurious sources of trauma to wildlife that we can identify and then hopefully mitigate those occurrences. So one of the diseases that we are on the lookout for, and fortunately, New York State uh, has not identified chronic wasting disease since 2005, but this is a, a very important disease. New York is the only state to have eliminated it once it was detected. Chronic wasting disease is uh, in the family of diseases known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. And this family includes diseases like mad cow disease. And this is a concern for human health because of that association um, in that same family. Now, chronic wasting disease is caused by a prion, which is different than a virus or a bacteria that you may be familiar with. This is actually a misfolded protein. And because of this misfolding, the body is no longer able to break down these proteins. And there are similar diseases that we see in people called creutzfeldt jakob disease and uh, scrapie in sheep. So chronic wasting disease is fatal. There is no known treatment, there's no vaccine, there's no resistance. And naturally affected species include white-tailed deer, mule deer, elk, reindeer, and moose. And the really hard part about this disease is that these animals become infected and they may be infected for more than a year before they end up dying. While they're infected, they end up with holes in their brain which cause them to be more prone to things like vehicle strikes or um, mortality from hunting. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about me and how my chronic wasting disease journey led me to where I am now at Cornell. So I've run the, the gamut of uh, when I was doing my dissertation work in Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota. I did everything hands-on with the animal, including you know catching deer with helicopters and sampling them. From there, as Steve mentioned, I worked at the National Wildlife Health Center which is sort of the equivalent of the Centers for Disease Control, but for wildlife. And that now led me uh, to be the director of the Cornell Wildlife Health Lab. And I've had the privilege of testifying before Congress on chronic wasting disease. So going all the way from the field to, to the hill. So 
with chronic wasting disease, it's really about uh, how this scales up to the population. So we take an individual animal, while they're alive and infected, they're walking around on the landscape, they may look perfectly fine, but infected animals will shed prions in their saliva, feces, and urine during that time. And the challenge that we face is that these prions, because they're not living, because they're protein, are very hardy and they can exist in the environment, they can bind to the soil for a number of years uh, where another deer could come along and pick them up and become infected. And as I mentioned previously, that infected animals are more likely to die of other causes, uh, such as a predator or a hunter. So that's where you start seeing these population level impacts where you have animals dying sooner than they normally would and they can't produce the next generation of animals. Interestingly, we see some uh, characteristics in deer that we don't see in other species like elk. With deer, they're two to three times more likely to be infected with males. Uh, males are more likely to be infected than females, but we don't see that trend in elk, which gives us some uh, challenges in studying the epidemiology. And one of the questions that I get asked in every single presentation is, can people get CWD? Because there's a lot of people that consume venison. It's a very good source of protein. And thus far, there are no known cases of CWD in humans, which is very good news. But we need to be vigilant just because of that mad cow connection. And in doing that, the CDC recommends that nobody knowingly eat a CWD positive animal. The other challenge that we have with chronic wasting disease, as I mentioned, these prions can exist in the environment. And so what keeps me up at night, Steve, is the fact that these prions can also be taken up into plant tissues. And this has only been shown experimentally in the lab thus far. But they are plants that we like to eat as well, such as tomatoes, corn, wheat, carrots. And so we need to think about containing this disease, keeping it at very low prevalence where it already exists, and ensuring that it doesn't get moved around by our activities through hunting, through uh, captive deer and elk herd movements, that um, we can keep the disease at bay. Now, this disease has moved across the country so far. Just in uh, 2022, there were new, three new states added. I haven't updated the map yet for 2023, uh, but we can turn Florida red. So this disease is moving very quickly. And this isn't because deer and elk are moving across the country. This is directly as a result of human activities. So we need people to pay attention to regulations designed to minimize the risk of CWD introduction and spread. So in our lab, we are trying to find solutions for this very wicked problem. And one of the ways that we're doing this is through the Surveillance Optimization Project for Chronic Wasting Disease. Uh, you can find out more information about, uh, about this project uh, by going to the, the website, and there's a QR code there for you. This is a project that we started to give wildlife management agencies some tools so they can manage their data better, they can have more efficient and effective surveillance, and they can make better decisions using models, being informed about what their neighbors are doing. And another benefit of this chronic wasting disease surveillance that we're doing, and I'm showing New York here, is the samples that we collect. They're, they're the lymph nodes that if you go to the doctor, you might, um, they might feel the lymph nodes under your chin to see if they're enlarged. Those samples can also be used for other disease testing. So opportunistically, we were able to use these same CWD samples when the pandemic hit we went ahead and tested for SARS-CoV-2 in New York white-tailed deer. And because our samples are collected during the hunting season, we are only able to extrapolate to those periods. But as you may be aware, deer were deemed uh, to be susceptible to this disease. And when we went looking for it, we found it. This was a novel finding. And the, since uh, we started working on uh, SARS-CoV-2, we've seen now that a lot of different species can actually be infected with this virus. So we still do not know the origin. Humans are the reservoir for this disease. And from there, 
the virus has spilled over into a variety of species. And then particularly with deer, we've seen that deer have been able to transmit the virus to other deer. And this was very concerning because of that potential spill back into humans with a new variant. So we looked at the human data. So this is uh, human hospitalization cases, and then the time frame for when we collected our deer samples. And there were actually a lot of hospitalization peaks right after we collected our deer samples, which indicates a lot of people were infected and they were shedding the virus. Unfortunately, we were not able to identify the exact source of the virus, but looking uh, what we can glean from where we saw the biggest clusters, so the most virus on the landscape, it wasn't necessarily in urban areas. It was tended to be in more rural areas um, and not even necessarily where we had the highest deer densities. So uh, places like Staten Island were looking, deer there had different variants, and we saw different variants across the state. So it's it's um, puzzling how this actually spilled over into deer. Uh, you can see during the first year of the pandemic, the prevalence was very low, and then we increased to over 20% of our samples in 2021. We just completed the testing for 2022, and the virus has almost vanished. We had very few samples left. So the fact that deer may not be maintaining this indicates that deer might not be a reservoir for the virus. So as I said, we're very puzzled about how they got infected. Humans are the source, uh, but we don't know exactly how. So whether it was direct contact through wildlife rehabilitation, uh, contact with captive servant herds, or as something intermediate where people were feeding wildlife, uh, if they were contacting it through wastewater, or other reservoirs that have not been identified yet. So that is uh, one of the challenges we face with wildlife. And I just wanted to quickly mention the other cervid species that we have in uh, New York, moose, that are typically found in the Adirondack area. We've seen a sort of a smallish number of moose which exist at the southern end of their range in New York. And they've had a number of health issues. And so we have a PhD student working on this to look at the health of moose. So we have two sources. We have live moose, and we've conducted helicopter captures to put call, GPS collars on them. And then we also recover all the dead moose that we're able to take. And by looking at their tissues, at their blood, and running diagnostics, we've seen that parasites are a major issue for moose. And so uh, we haven't experienced some of the external parasites like winter tick that we see in Maine and other New England states. But we do see some that may predispose moose to other sources of mortality like brain worm, where they're, they're not necessarily functioning as well as they could, um, which would lead them to maybe be more likely to be hit by a car. So I'm going to transition now and, and just mention uh, one of the big projects that we've been working on for a while, uh, lead in bald eagles. And so if you're not familiar with this topic, it's a, a very common ammunition type. Uh, most hunters use lead bullets when pursuing white-tailed deer, and white-tailed deer are uh, one of the primary game species in North America. And the design of these bullets is to fragment on impact with the animal to cause massive damage so that animal hopefully dies very quickly and does not suffer. The problem that we see with lead is that these small fragments, so um, as small as a grain of rice, can travel up to 30 centimeters away from that wound channel. So this presents not only a, a hazard for humans that may ingest lead in this venison, but then when a hunter is field dressing a deer, so that's removing the internal organs uh, before he takes it home, uh, that those being left in the field are deemed an attractive nuisance for eagles scavenging the carcass or, or other mammalian or avian scavengers. 
And so what we've seen is that fragments as small as a grain of rice can kill a bald eagle. So we wanted to identify whether this was an individual eagle problem um, and did it have a scale up to the population. So with seven Northeast states data from wildlife rehabilitators, state agencies, and diagnostic labs, we examined data from over 1,200 eagles and we saw that a very large proportion of them were exposed to lead. And because we don't know exactly when an eagle ate um, something and how much it was exposed to, we can't say um, whether it was acute or chronic necessarily, but we did see that 37% of these eagles submitted um, to these facilities had levels that were toxic to them. And this translated to uh, about a 5% decline in the long-term population growth rate. So everybody says bald eagles are a conservation success story, and that is completely true, but it was just like driving a car forward while keeping your foot on the gas. It wasn't as efficient as it could have been. And what we've seen now with this analysis is that bald eagles, yes, have been able to recover, but they're maximized uh, their resiliency. So they might not be able to handle other challenges from uh, climate change or other introduced diseases. And so I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Bloodgood, to let her talk. Yeah, fantastic. And great examples of the One Health approach, looking at those relationships between our own health, the health of our wildlife or domestic animals, really, really well described. I'm going to introduce Jenny. Jenny's uh, another esteemed colleague from the Cornell Wildlife Health Center and the Cornell Wildlife Health Lab, and she's a wildlife veterinarian with the New York State Wildlife Health Program and an assistant professor of practice at our College of Veterinary Medicine. Prior to joining to Cornell, Jenny was a research veterinarian at Dauphin Island Sea Lab, where she oversaw stranding response, necropsies, and disease research focused on marine mammals in Alabama and offered educational opportunities to agency partners, volunteers, and students. She holds bachelor's and master's degrees in wildlife biology from Clemson University, a PhD in integrative conservation from the University of Georgia, and a doctorate of veterinary medicine from the University of Georgia with a focus on research in wildlife health. As both a wildlife veterinarian and a biologist, she has a broad interest in free-ranging wildlife health and disease, and she has particular interest in pathology, infectious disease, the interface of human and wildlife health that we're continuing to discuss, and she enjoys mentoring students and working on interdisciplinary teams to tackle real-world issues. Jenny, over to you. Thanks so much, Steve, and thanks, Kristen, for that great beginning. I'm going to build off of what Kristen was just talking about and talk about another threat that bald eagles and other wildlife are facing, and that's avian influenza. And I really like this figure because avian influenza is an influenza A virus, and this figure really shows what a One Health issue this is because influenza A viruses can infect domestic animals, wild animals, and even people. And today I'm gonna to talk about the most recent outbreak of avian influenza that is currently ongoing, and that's an H5N1 uh, variety. And it is it was first introduced into the United States at the end of 2021. And since that time, there's actually been over 59 million domestic um, poultry affected, backyard and commercial flocks, um, and even some people around the world. And today, though, I'm going to focus on the wildlife implications. So we have these great fact sheets on the Cornell Wildlife Health Lab website. And later, I have a link and a QR code to that website. And you're welcome to visit it and read. There's lots of fact sheets about different diseases. And this one is our avian influenza fact sheet. And just a little bit of background about this disease. Uh, water birds are the natural reservoirs, meaning that they can harbor the disease and may not even show clinical signs and spread it to other animals. Uh, the virus is shed in feces and mucus and saliva, and it can be transmitted via ingestion or inhalation of that infectious material. Clinical signs of highly pathogenic avian influenza in wildlife range from inapparent to severe and include death. Um, highly pathogenic avian influenza, the virus is classified as low path or high path based on its effects in poultry. So highly pathogenic basically means that it's having a, a devastating effect on our, our poultry industry. So the wildlife hospital at Cornell was kind enough to share some photos and videos of animals affected with highly pathogenic avian influenza. 
Um, and I just want to forewarn anybody who um, is watching these that they are a little bit sad. Um, and there are some video, some uh, photos later that have dead animals in them. So I just wanted to let you know that in advance. The photo on the left here is a Canada goose, and you can see that its eye is a little bit cloudy. Um, and that's been shown in domestic ducks that were experimentally infected with highly pathogenic avian influenza as well. And it's just an effect of corneal edema. So it's a way to potentially identify birds that might be affected with high path AI. The video in the middle here is a Canada goose um, that has avian influenza. And you can see the, the stumbling there is a neurologic sign. And we're going to zoom in a little bit to see that that eye as well is cloudy. And then the last video I have here is a bald eagle uh, displaying some head tremors that are a, a neurologic symptom as well. So these are our detections that we've had in, in New York State over the last two years um, since, since the beginning of the outbreak in the end of 2021. And this is listed by species. This is only animals that were detected through the Cornell Wildlife Health Lab's relationship with the New York Department of Environmental Conservation. And these are only the uh, samples that went on to the National Veterinary Services Laboratory to be confirmed as H5N1 clade 2344B, which is the current circulating outbreak. So these species listed here are color coded by their taxonomic order. And then they also in parentheses have the number of individuals that were that had a detection in them. And the ones with stars next to them were ones that were detected in 2023. All the other ones had their initial detection in 2022. So of interest here, you can see, like, like I mentioned, this has been a threat to bald eagles. So bald eagles have been disproportionately affected by this disease, um, likely related to them being often living near um, water systems and potentially eating water birds or scavenging birds um, or other animals that may have had avian influenza. There was a nice study uh, by Nicole Nemeth out of the University of Georgia, the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study that showed that bald eagles also had um, increased nest failures and decreased reproductive success overall related to infections um, during this outbreak of avian influenza. So it's something to certainly keep an eye on um, with these birds. And then on the right here, you can see that mammals have also been affected during this outbreak. And it's been sort of um, not entirely unique to this outbreak, but an interesting part of this outbreak that so many mammals have been affected. So you can see in, in New York State, we've had three species affected, um, the most being red fox. And that's just another interesting um, thing that we're not really sure why red fox have been disproportionately affected, but you know perhaps it's that they're in these peri-urban environments, maybe more often seen by people. They will scavenge um, and eat birds. Um, so there's another uh, nice study that was a collaboration with our lab um, out of Wisconsin by Betsy Almo that goes through the pathology of mammals affected with avian influenza that it would be nice to check out. So just to zoom out a little bit, this is the United States map. Um, and we have the, it's from the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, updated most recently on October 4th. And this is all of the wild bird detections in every state. And you can see that the total count there, it's over 7,000 birds have been affected. And now you can see the same map, but for mammals. So this one, um, you can see the different um, uh, labels on the right there and which animals have been affected. So these are all of the mammal species that have been confirmed with highly pathogenic avian influenza virus infections. And of particular interest to me are these. Um, so these are marine mammal detections. Interestingly, there was one in Florida. Um, it was a single bottlenose dolphin that was found alive and then, and then died. It was having neurologic symptoms and died and was found to be the first marine mammal um, detection of this particular strain of the virus in the United States. 
And then in Maine, we had an outbreak of harbor and gray seal avian influenza cases in which enough animals died that it was actually termed an unusual mortality event by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, and that has a specific definition, but it basically means that more than the usual number of animals were stranding and they um, tested and a, a, a number of them were positive for avian influenza virus. And then over in Washington, more recently, just in the last couple of months, there's been several detections of H5N1 um, in harbor seals there as well. Um, and this issue goes beyond the United States. That's our focus today, but um, it's affected marine mammals around the world and other animals. So um, the reason that I have an interest in marine mammals, like Steve mentioned in my introduction, um, is my background. So I um, did my PhD on, on sea turtles, but then went on to work with the Alabama Marine Mammal Stranding Network, and that's based at Dolphin Island Sea Lab in Alabama where I was their veterinarian and researcher for live and dead animal response. And that was prior to me coming here um, with the Cornell Wildlife Health Lab almost a year ago. Um, and here I am also a, a veterinary researcher. Um, and I still get to work with marine mammals, which is really exciting. So that picture on the bottom right is me hosting a, um, a necropsy workshop with vet students who are interested in working on marine mammals. So. What is a marine mammal stranding? That word you know, can be a little um, interesting. What does that mean? Uh, it actually has a specific definition from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and that is any sick, injured, or deceased marine mammal, or a marine mammal that is out of its normal habitat and doesn't have the capability of returning to that normal habitat. So why should we investigate strandings? Um, well, marine mammals are a sentinel species, and basically that means that their health can reflect the health of the environment around them. Therefore, if we look into reasons for them stranding or dying, we can potentially identify threats not only to them, but also to ourselves and the environment as a whole. And then we can look at affecting management to help mitigate those threats. And I just wanted to throw this um, hotline number in here in case you do encounter a stranded marine mammal. There are special hotline numbers that you can call. And in the greater Atlantic region, it's that red number there. And this number and numbers for other regions in the United States are available online. So I'm going to show a couple of pictures throughout this, like I mentioned, of um, deceased marine mammals. These are from Alabama, and you can see you know, where they stranded and around the time they stranded in the little caption. Uh, this one is an interesting one just because I think it really demonstrates that marine mammal strandings are a One Health issue. You can see all of the houses right in the background. Marine mammals often um, are found by the public, and that's how reporters know where to go uh, to document strandings. So I wanted to share this paper that actually just came out a couple of months ago. And if you scan that QR code, it'll actually download the PDF for you. Otherwise, you can Google it. It's open access, so it's freely available. Uh, but this is some work that we just completed um, at Dolphin Island Sea Lab. And that was looking at causes of death in bottlenose dolphins from 2015 to 2020. And we found that the three most common causes of death were infectious, human and fisheries interaction, and prolonged freshwater exposure. And today, I want to just highlight the, the last two, so human and fisheries interaction and prolonged freshwater exposure. So human and fisheries interactions uh, don't always but can lead to death in marine mammals. Good examples of when it can lead to death are things like vessel strikes or entanglement in fisheries gear. And the photo on the left here is a bottlenose dolphin that unfortunately died because it drowned after being entangled in fishing gear. So um, the marks around the rostrum or like above the, the mouth there are impressions from, from a net that wrapped around the rostrum. And then this individual also had evidence of, of drowning. It had froth in its airways and pulmonary edema. Um, and unfortunately, cases of human and fisheries interaction are increasing in the Gulf of Mexico. So our colleagues were able to show this um, throughout the Gulf of Mexico, and then Alabama is a particular hotspot for human interactions. So 
the good news about this is that this is a threat that we can identify and address. Um, so the Alabama Marine Mammal Stranding Network, the Department of Natural Resources there has been working with NOAA fisheries to create educational and outreach materials, work with fishermen and boat recreational boaters and fishermen and out on the water um, to, to educate um, and let them know what they should do if in the case that they do you know, encounter a marine mammal that um, is distressed or, or has evidence of human interaction. And then the last thing I want to talk about is prolonged freshwater exposure. So you can see on the bottom these two images of bottlenose dolphins um, that have skin lesions that are indicative of freshwater exposure in these animals. So Bottlenose dolphins do have populations that uh, live in bays, sounds, and estuaries that are, you know, dynamic areas that are exposed to freshwater discharge all the time, and they've adapted to this. Um, but sometimes that discharge is is so much that the the freshwater exposure can cause these lesions. These lesions can coalesce and get larger um, and lead to secondary infections um, and ultimately osmotic imbalances and even death in the animal. So we wanted to learn more about freshwater exposure in bottlenose dolphins and there's a lot of groups looking at this right now but our colleague at Dolphin Island Sea Lab Christina Diaz-Clark created this um, nice figure here that I'll walk you through. So the, the dashed blue line shows freshwater discharge into Mobile Bay. The green line shows salinity, and you can see that as the discharge increases, the salinity decreases in response. And then across the bottom, you have dates and um, the bars. The darker bars represent bottlenose dolphins that stranded with these lesions, and the white bars represent strandings that did not have lesions. And you can see that animals with lesions, um, peaks in stranded animals occurred after these drops in salinity. And something we're going on, this works in preparation, um, but we're going on to look at is the magnitude and the duration of these drops in salinity and how that relates to the numbers of animals that are stranding. So freshwater is a one health issue. Um, not only does freshwater itself affect dolphins and the ecosystem around them, it also um, can convey other nutrients. Um, so this product, this project um, is Anya Brown, she's a PhD student at Dolphin Island Sea Lab and University of South Alabama, is building on our freshwater research to look at nutrients, um, contaminants, and pollutants. Um, and even pathogens that are coming in with this freshwater discharge. She's looking at it in the water and then also in dolphins and its implications that it might have for humans. Um, so this is a, a really great example of a One Health project that hopefully you guys can keep an eye out for her work in the future. So with that, I wanted to just thank everybody for attending. This is the Cornell um, website, the Cornell Wildlife Health Lab website, and you can scan that QR code. It'll take you right there, and it's full of great resources. Um, the next slide also has that same QR code, but some of the resources um, include these fact sheets, and you can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at CornellCWHL. And with that, I will turn it back over to Steve. All right, fantastic. So we have um, time for discussion and questions. And uh, boy, there's a lot to chew on. I know we're going to solicit some questions from the listeners. Um, I w and I'm going to get to a mix of questions. Oh, they're already coming in. That's fantastic. So before we got on air, we were talking about what keeps us up at night as as wildlife health professionals. Can Can maybe Jenny... Can you say more about avian influenza and, and the, the pandemic potential? We're on the tail end, hopefully, of, of COVID. And I worry about coronaviruses like SARS-CoV-2, but I'm, I'm pretty worried about avian influenza, given the diversity of species, birds, mammals, around the world. I mean, am I overreacting? Personally, I don't really think you're overreacting. Um, it, the, that is something that I would say keeps me up at night as well. Um, so especially with these uh, recent outbreaks in, in seals, and seal, um, particularly seals, um, 
they've shown some adaptations that you know would be indicative of potential pandemic potential. Um, so avian influenza viruses are really great at reassorting and evolving and mutating. Um, so the more they're able to adapt to different hosts, the more likely it is that they could adapt to being in, in people. Um, so far, there I think have, there's been 11 human deaths across the world. Um, most of those people have had direct interactions with, with poultry. They work on poultry farms or have um, pet poultry. Um, so, and the risk has stayed low. Uh, the CDC still says that the risk is low as well. Um, but I think it's, it's there. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe on a slightly more optimistic note, we, <laughs> chronic wasting disease, despite their relationship with, with mad cow and other prion-related diseases, we've never seen a case in people. Are, are, are you worried about that, or do you think we're, we're taking the right precautions in terms of the recommendations to the hunting community? I, I think that it's something that hunters should be aware of, and depending on their level of, of comfort with risk, they should know what their opportunities are for getting their animal tested, particularly if they're hunting in an area known to have CWD. Um, fortunately, you know we have pretty good confidence in the surveillance we've done in New York over time uh, to build that up. But as far as, you know, the risk to humans, there's evidence sort of on both sides of the coin. You know, I mentioned the mad cow risk, and that was seen um, as a disease in younger people. It was called variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, where they developed sort of um, dementia-like symptoms, and they were uh, had incoordination, stumbling, and ultimately died. So it's, it's a very sad disease because it is fatal and there isn't any treatment. Um, on the flip side of that, there's the other disease I mentioned, scrapie and sheep, where, that has been known for 400 years, and people have you know, consumed those animals, and there haven't been any known cases. So I don't think we can really... Uh, draw conclusions either way, and that's why I tend to operate on the precautionary principle, which is, you know, sort of the opposite of the burden of proof, where, you know, this looks bad. We think it may or may not happen, but let's take the precautions until it's proven to be safe. And so I think that's really how we should operate all overall with chronic wasting disease because the one truth that I've I've seen from CWD over you know the 20 years I've been working on it is that the news usually gets worse about it we haven't had a lot of uh, good successes and so the more we can just keep it at bay now and and take those precautions and and treat it seriously I think the better off we'll be in the long term you know decades from now no, that's very important. And, and I want to get back to some uh, so the work you were doing on on lead poisoning, which obviously you, the work was focused on eagles. It affects a lot of other species. We have obviously cases of lead poisoning in children. I mean, when we get lead fishing weights and lead shot in the environment, can you see anything on the horizon in terms of alternatives to lead shot that are acceptable to the hunting community and less dangerous in terms of of public health? Well, that's a, a really challenging issue for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one being right now, even if hunters um, do want to switch to a non-lead alternative, and we're mostly talking about rifle bullets. Those are the ones that fragment. Um, things like slugs tend to stay intact and animals you know, are able to, to eat around them. Uh, even lead shot isn't used for waterfowl hunting since the, the ban in 1991. But with uh, rifle bullets, there's not a lot of non-lead ammunition that's currently available. It's being manufactured, but uh, overall there's an ammunition shortage. There's challenges because that ammunition is more uh, expensive than sort of your run-of-the-mill lead ammunition. But hunters have alternatives. If they're not able to find the ammunition that fits their particular firearm, then they can do things like um, not field dress their deer and leave the, the entrails out for scavengers. They can take those and dispose of them in the trash or, or bury them. So while I personally am a hunter and I use non-lead ammunition, I understand that not everybody is able to do that. So we want to make sure that it's it's not about you know stopping hunting at all. This is totally about 
understanding the risks that you're presenting when you, you harvest an animal, the intent is just to harvest that animal and not have detrimental effects on other species. No, thank you. We have a question from the audience about the, the way prions reproduce. They're, they're obviously a very strange thing, these prions. Can, can, you, can you tell us what the current thinking is on that compared to what we understand more easily regarding bacteria and viruses? Yeah, they're, they're almost like the, if you could design a disease agent, this would be the one, you know, that you would, you would win the competition. Uh, so as I mentioned, they're a, a protein, and we have these prions in our body normally. They, they have normal cellular prions um, that exist in the, the central nervous system, so your brain, spinal cord, and other organs. But <coughs> the abnormal form uh, is when one abnormal one gets into a deer's body and it can cause uh, the normal prions to misfold in the same way. And in doing that, they make it so uh, the body can't break down these proteins anymore. So we're constantly building proteins and breaking them back down. And because our body can't, or a deer's body can't break down CWD prions, um, they start to build up and they form plaques on the surface of the brain cells, essentially smothering the brain cell. And that causes the cell to die and that's how you end up with holes in your brain. Not pleasant. Not at all. So we've talked about the canaries in the coal mine that we see. You talked about marine mammals as sentinels, pollutants and things like that. Can you uh, talk a little bit about amphibians. We didn't have a lot of time uh, during the, the formal hour, but we see a, a range of things happening around the world. And what can you, what are they telling us about our own freshwater systems? Well, amphibians are, are challenging and they're some of the most uh, threatened and endangered species. I mean, with our, um, our own systems in North America, we have some of the best salamander biodiversity in the world, which a lot of people don't know about. And so they're, they're facing threats, you know, not only from the things we typically think about, you know, development and water quality, sedimentation and streams, but when we look at this from a, a pathogen perspective, the linkages that we see between species with uh, chytrid fungus, so it has a very long name, but um, essentially this fungus was introduced through human activities and it has been devastating to a lot of frogs and salamander populations globally. And so we have been trying to understand, you know, are there things that you can do like vaccination for critically endangered species? The one we've studied in New York is the Eastern Hellbender, which has a lot of fun names like snot otter. They're, they're salamanders that can grow to be like two feet long and they're very Amazing. slimy, Amazing yeah. slippery. Um, and unfortunately, the, the vaccination didn't work. But what we learned in doing that research is that we saw these hellbenders could exist with low levels of the fungus and that they were able to, to compensate for that in, in the way that they operate. Um, so we, we see an amazing resilience of these wild species to some of these insults, you know, that, that humans moving things around and introducing new challenges to them. But... Um, you know, we're always on the lookout for the next sort of danger. And for uh, salamanders in particular, there's a different type of chytrid that's been found in Europe that's devastating some of their populations. And so we're very worried about things like the pet trade introducing these because, you know, you buy your kid, uh, you know, a cool new pet and they don't take care of it. And you think, oh, I'll release it into the wild. And, and that's just not... Um, a good idea because that is not a native species and it could potentially harbor things that would harm native wildlife. Yeah, we might need to do a whole other show on that. I mean, my understanding is that the United States is the single largest importer of wildlife around the world. Is that still the case? I believe so. I, I just saw a paper about it and um, an analysis of the the various species that are imported. And of course, here in New York, we're we're definitely concerned about this because we have some of the biggest import-export uh, hubs in the, the world, really. And given our human population and, and the way that, um, you know, 
construction is happening and, and just uh, encroachment into wild spaces. We have to be really vi- vi- vigilant for uh, these effects on wild populations. One of our viewers was uh, wanting to know a bit more about the New York State's success regarding chronic wasting disease. What's, what's the secret sauce that, that uh, New York's been able to maintain? Well, knock, it, knock on wood. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, it might have been a little bit of, of luck in there, but I think um, I didn't have time to, to go into it. But in 2005, CWD was detected in two captive deer herds in Oneida County. And working together, the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation was able to depopulate those herds. And they also stood up a containment area around that, that faci- those facilities of uh, 10 miles, which impacted a lot of people and, and their ability to you know, move hunted uh, carcasses out of that area and testing requirements. There were two wild deer that were discovered to have CWD, and uh, through the management efforts, which were quite aggressive, um, they never found another case of it. And so we continue to to examine deer closely for chronic wasting disease. But really, I think the as far as the the secret sauce, I would say it was the interagency cooperation, the the swift movement on it, the diligence with which they um, sort of attacked this problem and didn't say, ah, we'll just learn to live with it. Um, They took it very seriously. And, you know, as far as the economics of the money that they've saved in not having to deal with this disease compared to other states that are challenged by it and, and the amount of effort they have to put towards it, I think it was a huge benefit. And it's really difficult to encourage um, people to think about prevention. When you don't have something, it's hard to invest in it unless you realize how much it's going to save you in the long run. Yeah, no, absolutely. You, uh, you, you've piqued the interest of uh, several of our, our viewers relating to the notion of prions ending up in plants and potentially their roots. I know there, you know, there was a lab study. Can you say any more about how concerned we should be about prions once they're in the soil and potentially getting into plant products? Well, I guess I'm not, I'm not terribly worried about it. Like, what worries me the most is not necessarily human consumption of these plants because we do think there's a good species barrier and we haven't seen any cases of CWD in humans. Um, and, and it's one of those things where I wouldn't have necessarily thought this before the pandemic um, because it, it seems like a little bit of a the sky is falling approach. But what concerns me is sort of big agriculture because there have been at least two instances in different countries now where they were very concerned about um, agricultural products, so hay and grain, coming from CWD-positive areas. And I'm worried about uh, other countries that take the United States exports that they might someday say, we don't want, you know, we're worried about the risk to humans or other animals from these products because prions could be in these plant tissues and we're not going to take those. Um, so that's sort of, you know, up out there in, in very low rumblings from other countries. It's not anything in the United States yet, but that, that concerns me a lot because I would have never said a pandemic could have, you know, the, the major economic and social and mental health challenges that we just all experienced. But now knowing that uh, that's sort of a Pandora's box, that's something that, that really worries me. So I think as far as uh, the plant tissues, we know that that is a transmission possibility to wild deer, but those experiments have been done in labs with um, transgenic mice, so little uh, mice that have some de- uh, deer genes in them, so they behave that way. Um, so we don't know if it really truly is a mechanism yet, but I, I worry about that. Yeah, yeah. Jenny, I wanted to ask you, when you think looking into the future and the future of our, the health of our oceans, what, what, what type of research do you think is a priority in, in the marine mammal realm in terms of the health, the health sciences? That's a lot. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot we could touch on there. Um, I think one of the biggest issues that I didn't even talk, talk about today is plastics um, and marine pollution. 
for marine mammals. So uh, we've seen, you know, especially now more research being done on microplastics and uh, finding them in not only the digestive tract of the animal, but other tissues as well. Um, so, you know, climate change, that's a huge one. So, I mean, for all of these, the freshwater um, that I spoke of earlier is mostly of related to increased precipitation, uh, and that can also be tied to climate change. Um, and animal movements are related to climate change as well. So that's, you know, a huge issue um, that we all need to sort of focus on for many reasons, but marine mammals are particularly affected by it. Um, their, their interactions with humans, the, the vessel strikes, the fishing gear, um, all of that. So they, they face threats from a lot of different directions, um, being, being animals that live in water and apex predators. So um, that's one of the things that makes them a good sentinel species. They're long-lived. They could live 40 years. Um, and, and they, you know, as apex predators, they're, they're eating high up the food chain. So things bioaccumulate and biomagnify in their tissues. Um, so they're a really good sentinel species for health of the ocean. So I think they're really important to, to watch. Great. Well, I, I want to, I wanna, you know, conclude a bit being optimistic. I mean, there's a lot of doom and gloom out there, but we are doing a lot of really important work uh, across the Cornell Wildlife Health Center and with our colleagues in, around the world in other centers. And I think one of the things that I'm starting to see, and at least in, in recent years, is a lot of the science is starting to get into the policy arena. We're starting to we're a very applied group, right? We're trying to solve problems, not just understand them. And I think your example of testifying in front of Congress, and, and I know you've been in work, in working with, with policymakers as well, and in New York State, the partnership between the DEC and Cornell is, is very exciting and compelling in and of itself for that reason, the science policy linkage. So I, I, I you know, particularly now that um, being relatively new to academia myself, being around young students, I, I look at that glass every morning. I say, oh, it's an eighth full. And those students inspire me because they are, you know, they're starting out on their careers and they see these problems, but they're, they're with us and getting trained so that they can help us solve them. And we are starting to solve them. We're not going to solve all of them, but the, the basis of the work to, to fix these problems is to understand them. So I wanted to thank both of you for everything that the Cornell Wildlife Health Lab does and for sharing all of this with us today. Again, if you want to know more about the Cornell Wildlife Health Center, there's a QR code there. We're at wildlife.cornell.edu. Thanks again, everybody.